So we continue and here we are. We start with a big rise, another kind of a sequence in the right hand. I like that idea of putting the third finger where you see it right here. So the way this works is we have this kind of uh, seventh chord rising up and then we fall down by step and another seventh chord every other note stepwise motion chordal motion All right so I'm just going to put those brackets in and it's up to you to make sure that the hand can find them so these kind of overlapping brackets that take care of this whole sequence. So right, they all have a certain shape to them and again maybe to bring back that idea of backwards practice start at the end right here and you know you're kind of holding this shape and you know that right before it that's the shape you have to hold fourth finger we're not using it so right you hold that shape and then you expand to this cyan colored uh, shape okay all right let's just say then this this is our green shape what's before that that So go from right before green into green and then continue to the cyan. That way you're teaching the hand to feel that, um, con I don't know what you want to call it, uh, construct of four different notes. And of course then, it has a certain rhyme to it you start to expect the squeeze of the hand the expansion of the hand squeeze expansion and so on so practice through this left hand is pretty straightforward uh, I'm not sure what there is to say about it really um, it's just has to play its notes so one way is you can put finger one here let's do that and this way finger five is already on uh, a, you just have to expand that first finger to its A right here. And of course, I suggest doing it right away so you're not waiting until the last moment. So, in other words, right here. I should really shift it to right after the A, like that. So you're just getting used to this idea of if the finger is done playing its key, move it to where it needs to be. Right. And every time you need to do a position, you can stop and check. Okay. Oops, there it is. So, um, one thing that might help is to do that if you want. Right, just little uh, rectangles to remind you where to stop and check. Stop, check. All right, now you're aware there are two rectangles right here. Yeah, so. Um, but again, the back backwards backwards way is a little easier because now that you don't worry about the fingerings for that, I would definitely try to maybe pl place at least the fourth finger on D, just as as something that helps to connect like that. So fourth already on on D, and then all you do is move the first finger out. Okay, so let's say you're in cyan and you're already prepared to play B right here. So cyan color, 
you've got that shape, you've got the B shape ready, and you just stop. Then, right, at the green color, we're holding this position, we're sort of, I have my left hand on the edge of the D, uh, my right hand is slightly inside, and it helps with reaching of that C sharp when I expand, and so that's all you do. Right? So here's my position, then I expand to my cyan colored position. Okay, that's all I'm doing, because then if I can do this, I can actually play those notes if I want to. I don't need to go on because if I'm in position for the cyan color, I can go on and I know I'll play those notes flawlessly. Right, as long I have it as, as I've done that kind of extension. Oh, by the way, I'm so far down, I'm completely forgetting to talk about this shift, right? So we're in the middle of the piano here. Ooh. I would go as far as down an octave right here. So that to me would be this kind of indication. T torso equals E4. Now E4 for, in my language is this E below middle E. For some people it's a different number. So uh, let's see, go back. So shift the position makes it much easier to play. Oh, wrong finger. So that would be the starting point. Now, as you come out, I'm just feeling my way through it. Uh, right, you see my torso, my nose, my chin shifts back to the middle as my right hand gets up to those high notes. So when I play the, the cyan colored, you know, I'm basically in the middle again. But just before it, oh, I just realized what my problem was. You know what? I, I need to just redo this whole uh, video almost. But let, let's, let's, not, let's not redo the video because it's so great because it shows that it can happen to anyone. Did you see that when I was, you know, obviously you saw it, when I was looking at the green and then the, the cyan colored notes, I just for some strange reason assumed, started to think that they're in the bass clef. And so here I was thinking that's how I should end this piece, even though I know, I know myself, this piece goes right, so the cyan colored notes, they're up here and yet I'm trying to play them down here. So, however, it did point out uh, something important, which is at the beginning, when I do in fact play these notes, right, at the beginning of this passage, all the way down below in the bass clef, do make sure to follow with your torso. Okay, now then, um, we're redoing the whole practice on the sign colored uh, notes. And the left hand is here, good. Now before it, green colored is this. And then I just expand. Here's my green colored position, boom. Okay, much better. And then before the green color, let's color it, I don't know, orange. You have this shape. Uh, I wouldn't even worry about what's really happening is you're pedaling on every bass note because that's what really moves our harmony. We're not so much concerned about in between stuff. So what that really means is even when I'm playing those orange notes, even though this is a half note below, I'm already feeling the shape of DD octave in the left hand. So, right, that's how I want to do it. Right, I don't even have to necessarily play those positions, I can just move my way through them like this and then just end up in the sign colored position but it's nice if you can hear what the sound is like right so from the orange or I don't know, brown colored 
uh, chord shape to the green color and then finally the cyan just summarizes the kind of general motions that my hand has to go through to play this passage and of course you keep going back here is let's color it red or pink fourth finger already on the D so maybe I'll go ahead and uh, put that in call it a four of course down below is a five so I'm just forcing my fourth onto D to make this transition easy in the left hand. All right, so there's my pink colored set of four notes, then green and cyan. And when I stop there just to check that my left hand is in position, my right hand is correct, so on. I really think advanced oops uh, advanced preparation of this D to D octave right here is a good idea All right, so when you stop on the for example the orange slash brown colored highlight just check your left hand checking your from the B down there okay so then if you've, you've got that sense of the position playing through the notes as written is pretty straightforward all right so uh, I think I've um, beaten this dead horse enough let's look at that cyan, cyan highlight and that particular measure over there see what's going on we're back to crazy fast leaps and that's that right here same thing if I start here let's color it truly red right? if I start right here easy but holding that B I have to master the, the, the jump boom one more time very very fast kind of twitchy muscle action in the upper arm there it is and that's all I have to do if I can do it then the next challenge will be of course this right here so two consecutives consecutive uh, position changes right here Because my thumb is about to play a G sharp right here, I need to push my hand inside the keyboard. Really would be a good idea to do that. So let's go ahead and um, put this kind of vertical arrow in here. Right, so as I'm preparing my left hand chord on the third beat, my right hand slides in now i'm preparing the fourth finger on the f sharp because i'll move the fifth finger over to g sharp and so that too can be penciled in so to speak you have one single finger to uh, prepare in the right hand but a massive chord shift in the left so I'm holding the third beat and then just practice in this boom oh, and not only the fifth finger also the first finger so this kind of annotation work really helps to summarize your thinking after you've done this and practiced it a few times the annotation really gets in the way because now you know what you're supposed to do and this is just extra uh, graphics on the page but at the beginning I find it's very very helpful to over annotate so you're not as I said before leaving uh, any stone unturned right. preparing that moment oh 
by the way, what's coming up? Let's see. So I'm having to play bottom A on the beginning of the next line here. Maybe I would go for myself. I would actually use finger three on this last E to E octave right here. Uh, just so it's easier to connect down to the A to A octave in the left hand. Now if you're finding 3 is a bit of a stretch, well sure you can use 5 and then find your way by um, using what I call... Uh, I forgot what I call it actually. It's like when between two position shifts there are notes in common, common notes. I should look that up. Anyhow, so let's say you have to do like this. 1, 5, note 3, 5, then um, you kind of, uh, I was about to sneeze, um, then you're thinking, okay, when I go to this A to A octave, what's actually going to happen is my second finger gets placed naturally on this E that previously I had my fifth finger on, right, so I'm thinking that kind of using that reference note to guide my second finger to where my fifth finger was, right? You can see that action. And that kind of naturally puts my uh, five and one on the notes I need. So that, that's another way to do it. But if your hand is big enough, try with three on the E then just kind of pivot around the E. Whichever way you do it, it really doesn't matter, as long as you know what you're doing. All right, and then when you leap from this A, I would just go with five right here. And not just five there, you are actually trying to stretch a big E to F sharp position, right? So kind of five deep inside the keys. So one more time, let's use that arrow, something like that. Right. Even if your thumb isn't quite reaching the F-sharp, maybe a little smaller hand, you're still positioning it as close to the F-sharp as you can. Now, similar to what we had in the past, I would recommend on this final C-sharp here, a, a thumb, just so it's easier to go like this. quite frankly irrelevant because it's still a long way down so you could use one two three four instead of that one again some of these fingering choices are there's an advantage to one there's an advantage to, advantage to another option you kind of have to play around and see which fits your hand better but in any case um, you can just barely see it first uh, note here, I'll highlight it yellow, and this note, of course, it's the exact same Mosso material, so luckily I don't really need to talk about uh, the next three measures here, because it's all the same stuff, but I do want to talk about, so this measure, right here, So, in the beginning, you prepare the notes. Let's see again. Perhaps it might be wise to just remind you that this happens, the very, very last thing on the previous line, right hand. You have to do that kind of little adjustment of the hand position, like that. So then when you come into this indigo highlighted measure, you're like this. By the way, you no longer have to be inside the keys. You, you can pull back out if you want to. It might actually make things a little easier so you're not stuck too far deep down inside the black keys. So if, if that's helpful to you, you can do that. Right? And then a little squeeze right here. And 
then of course that super super fast leap now you do have a writ which is nice you are slowing down you can take your time to find the uh, base clef right hand but still practice leaping as fast as you can there not only that you have to move your torso down so my suggestion is to actually start moving the torso from here so by the time you get to uh, mosso you're already shifted to where it's comfortable to play you know all, all of that material uh, so where is my torso equals once again e4 at least in my notation it is all right so mm -hmm. First leap, uh, beginning of that indigo measure. And then another position adjustment, just stop, check you're there. Ah. One thing you could consider actually. Go ahead and collect all your notes together, in, in both your of your hand positions together right here hold on yeah. this way I'll highlight them in what let's do green yeah so th th that position might actually be nice to prepare in both hands as you go down and shift your torso because again you have the pedal down you don't need to physically hold that E with finger five all the way until that um, third beat, the green highlight, and right just like here, you're not holding that quarter note. Right, you're not doing that. You've got the pedal down. So at green, while the pedal is doing all that holding, you're just. Check it. Yep, I've got all notes prepared in both hands. And this happens. So, of course, just like in the right hand, we have that kind of stuff going on in the left hand. And that's probably about it. Let's see what the pedal is doing. So, I start like this. You probably saw a little bit of a flutter it's what's known as the half pedal effect I don't want to get rid of that beautiful resonance right? this is a forte right here but as I come down there's a natural phrasing that's happening it's a little bit of a diminuendo because you know D E C B A right it's a little obnoxious to do that so we're going to D, C, B, A, right? And as I go down to the end of this musical phrase, um, my A is actually softer. So to help with that, I'm trying to filter out some of that harmony resonance. So when I get to that A, you can see that my overall resonance has decreased. Half pedal fluttering is not so easy. You need a good real piano, you need it well adjusted, but you, you can experiment. Yeah, in fact, some people do a pretty hardcore uh, pedal clearing right there on beat three. Also possible. happens uh, we start mosso material once again in this measure and because it's exactly the same as here in fact let me label how the same it is mm, let's use purple the all that stuff is the same from here all the way to oh uh, yes like that Mm, well, I guess that G-sharp could be included as well. But then what you'll notice, at the end of that uh, purple-colored, violet-colored line, 
we have that chord in first time but then down here uh, uh, where is this yes at the end of the blue color sorry purple violet colored line we don't have that chord in fact we just have F sharp G sharp and then the whole measure repeats the only difference is the bass uh, octave moves from B to D and you can see by my right pedal indicator I'm just keeping it down down until that pedal octave changes okay so that's good let's put in reminder leaps in my oh not on the last one in my left hand and we get to the a tempo measure piano one more time and this is very similar to what we had on the previous page isn't it let's just compare hold on let me zoom out right so if you look in the super small font uh, the zoom out where we change the key that melody is introduced tempo rubato so maybe i can zoom in like this tempo rubato on the previous page that's where that E, D, E, C, B, B, C melody is introduced for the first time. And here, yeah, let me continue zooming in. Here is where it comes back. So maybe I should label it with something just to make it a little um, clearer, I suppose, that, hey, we're, we're back to the B section. Shall we do that? B one and so here we would have zoom out on this page same thing b1 tempo rubato melody all right let's go back to the second time it occurs one more time okay so here we have this b1 come back something's not working all right, here we go. B1 comes back, but of course this time the other voices. That's how we started at on the previous page. Here it's the harmony has changed. All those other voices are playing different notes. So we have to slightly adjust our fingering. Let's think about it just for a split second. Still, for me, the same logic occurs for the top line that would be a four that would be a three three maybe five so a lot we're borrowing a lot of the same ideas from before in fact a couple of other options but essentially the alto voice just one 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 in the right hand yeah so that's easy because it has to play the black keys again another reason to stay inside the keyboard like this and so b1 e do do way you don't see where I'm playing so let's look at the tenor and bass here same thing we're about to play this the thumb on the next line you can't quite see it unfortunately with this zoom but um, let's put the left hand inside the keyboard as well okay now we're going to the next line here it is inside the keyboard both hands not here it's impossible to reach the C sharp otherwise I know I had something very similar in the right hand before 
think about it. Uh, um, before it was that. Here it's still the same idea though. So we have right in the left hand. I'm letting. I've got the pedal down. And I'm kind of really squeezing my thumb to to be on the same key as my second as I'm reaching reaching towards that B with the fifth finger right something like that it allows me to find it then I still have the problem of finding that two five uh, down here and just what I mentioned you know about five ten minutes ago it's useful to be aware of which notes are shared and so in this case of course it's this note that becomes this note and we're exchanging fifth finger here for the second finger here yeah. so again reach and reaching and then A lot of this is very similar to what we had before. And I think this is exactly the same as on the previous page. Let me just check. Yes, yes, yes. So from here on out, we are dealing with so that's nice it means that to the end of this page that i'm currently working with you on in fact let me change my view there it is the bottom of both pages you can see that let me so i've used the purple let me now use some other color maybe this whatever now let's try Indigo. Yeah, just making sure I'm not telling you something wrong, but basically all the way to here is the same as all the way to here, right? So let's count measures. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yep. The only difference is the way it's laid out on the two pages. You'll see that uh, the editor squeeze for some unknown reason. Um, I, let me see if maybe I come out of this editor mode. Okay. So you see on the first page, we have four measures squeezed into that second to last line and on the next page um, material all the notes are the same but the no there are only three measures on that second to last line whereas the last line on the previous page there are three measures and on this next page that we're currently looking at there are four measures and yet all the material is the same and I'm trying to see am I, am I crazy doesn't look like it. I mean, I'm comparing note for note, note for note, measure for measure. Uh, for instance, you can see one little difference. Um, and I, I'll be very interested in looking at Debussy's holograph, his autograph manuscript, how he wrote it down. But you can see that in the first page, where that indigo thin line begins, that bracket, the hairpin crescendo and decrescendo are in the middle between the two staffs but on this uh, next page where this thin indigo line begins and all the same material begins that hairpin up and down figure is above the staff why well I mean I can kind of see how there's not much <laughs> space left to squeeze them in between the staffs but is that how Debussy had it was there a reason, a musical reason to do it differently? I don't think so. I think both of these sections are played exactly the same way on both of these pages. So anyway, but again, you might have other ideas and you can definitely leave me a comment. Maybe you're using a different edition. So that'll be an interesting discussion. But yeah, anyway, so 
from what I can see, musically, both of these sections are the, exactly the same. And that's very nice because we don't need to practice it differently. We just need to accept the fact that they are presented differently uh, because of the editorial or, or whoever the typesetter was for this edition uh, for that reason. Anyway, uh, so that's it. Uh, we took care of a whole page one more time. So next session we'll have to look at what's coming up, which is, okay, here. Ah, I need to shift my view there. So top of that next page, we have something completely different, the Resol Resoluto. Is it Resoluto or Re Resoluto? I forget. I think it's Resoluto because um, Italian doesn't um, harden the S sound like in German. So um, yeah, uh, we'll look at that next time. Definitely new material here, different character of the music. Senza pedale, which is important, something different for the first time. Um, you see some annotations there already. I'll get rid of them next time just so we can start with a blank slate. But yeah, enjoy your uh, further practicing on this piece. See you next time.